Hey everyone, this is Melissa Fleetwood, guest lecturing for Chapter 26, Food Safety. Thank you again for having me. I'm really excited. So, food safety is my jam. I don't know about you all, but I am not a germaphobe at, by any means, but when it comes to the kitchen, I really like having it clean. Before I start cooking, before I do anything in the kitchen, I like to wipe down my countertops, my table, make sure my cutting boards are clean, make sure all my produce is clean before I even start cooking. So that's a first step for me. I don't know how you all roll. Some of you might be really comfortable in your kitchen. You don't feel like you need to do that, but I share my kitchen with a few other people and I won't have a peace of mind unless it's been cleaned first. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the slideshow. So what is food safety and why is it important? Food safety prevents foodborne illness. So foodborne illness is transmitted from food or water that contains a microscopic organism, its toxic secretions, or a toxic chemical. So more, 48 million Americans report foodborne illness each year. That's one in six people. I did not know this before lecturing on this topic, but there's a, a 128 128,000 hospitalizations per year and 3,000 deaths per year, which is pretty serious um, considering that food illness not only gets people sick, but leads to hospitalization and for some even death. So I take it pretty seriously. So the book gives a, a little bit of an overview and um, says there's about three basic categories, physical hazards, chemical hazards, and biological hazards, and three conditions they name as a result from food safety problems. So basically not, um, not participating in food safety protocols um, or things that you would do such as like wiping down and cleaning the counters, washing your hands, not um, avoiding cross-contamination. Those kinds of things are illness caused through transmission of disease. So here the book is, re is really talking about like when somebody doesn't wash their hands and they're touching utensils or touching um, um, counter space that other people are going to be using and interacting with. Um, food poisonings caused by microorganisms. That's heavily what this chapter is about. And food poisonings caused by agents other than microorganisms, which they talk about like mercury and tuna. So the majority of foodborne illness cases go unreported and symptoms of foodborne illness vary. Um, most foodborne illness can be avoided through proper uh, handling food properly and food uh, prep, good food preparation practices. So on this slide, I included Southern Nevada Health District shout out. Um, I was there working there and I really enjoyed it and I really love all of the departments um, that are in that place. So one of the things that I got to do as a dietetic intern was I got to go on a ride along um, with a, f um, a food inspector and it was great. Um, so I got to I got to go um, look, uh, follow and shadow this woman, actually two different women, and it was really great to see that they really are doing all the things that the textbook talks about when it comes to like cleaning and sanitizing and checking all of these um, protocols in place. Uh, and actually, one of the places, uh, one of the ride-alongs I did, one of the restaurants got shut down. Uh, first of all, their dishwasher wasn't working, which was like ew. But the per, but the food inspector that I was with, they checked um, the temperature of the water, the pH of the water. It's really cool to see that in action. But they had already had issues before and were given warnings and told the date that the food inspector would be back to check to make sure that they made those changes and they didn't. So the restaurant got shut down. It was crazy, but I was really grateful. I'm like, if you're not keeping things clean and you're not following these procedures that are in place to protect you, the employees and um, patrons of the restaurant, I don't think that you should be open, especially when they gave you warnings and you didn't fix them. I'm, I'm just glad that she took it seriously. Um, so anyways, there's this really cool app. I'll bring it up again um, and then later on in the slideshow, but I utilize this app and it's called... Hold on, let me look for it. Did I put it in here? Let's see. I believe if you just look up, oh, I wrote, I know where I wrote it down. I have it on my, I have it um, on my phone, but I don't know, remember the title of the app. So it's free. And this is Restaurant Grade Southern Nevada. So if you go into your app store and you look for Restaurant Grade Southern Nevada, you'll find this app and it was created by the Health District. So when you go, 
when you download this app and you go to other restaurants in the city, you can look for their grade. But before, if you're like, say you're with friends or you're with family and you're deciding where you want to go, you can actually pull this app up and look up that restaurant and see what their most recent grade was and why they were given that grade. So pretty cool stuff. I definitely recommend. Okay, so this slide I really like. I know it's really teeny tiny and kind of small to read, but I will read it to you. Um, so this is, I like this because it's kind of just like the full picture of farm to table. All the different places where um, if we're not practicing food safety, uh, microorganisms can be introduced and there's a possibility for foodborne illness. And I just think it's a really great um, visual because there's so many areas where Things can go wrong. Okay, so farms. Animals raised for meat can harbor harmful microorganisms and crops can be contaminated with pollutants from irrigation runoff from streams, microorganisms, or toxins in soil, or pesticides. Contamination can also occur during animal slaughter or from harvesting, sorting, washing, packing, and or storage of crops. Whoa. So I like it. You can continue to read this or pause the video and go through, but you can see the different areas, processing, transportation, retail, and table. So a lot of these things are outside of our control unless we're, we chose a career in the food industry where we are in control. Maybe we become uh, food or health inspectors. Maybe we work on the farms. You never know. With your nutrition degree, you can go a lot of places. Um, so these are all options, but one thing we can control is... Um, table. So I talk a little bit about that later on in this uh, in this presentation. So food production factors and foodborne illness has become increasingly complex. Oversight has decreased. More foods are mass produced. Ingredients come from various sources and contam contamination can occur at any point from farm to table. So it's great that we're learning about it so we can practice at home, um, but it's really important that companies and employees are trained on it as well since we are having are eating out at restaurants but also purchasing um foods from our grocery stores so causes of foodborne illness so um there's two types food infection illness resulting from eating food contaminated with living organisms food and food intoxication illness resulting from eating food in which microbes have secreted toxins and or poisons so your book uh, labels harmful microorganisms as pathogens, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. Um, organisms to be aware uh, to be aware of include bacteria, fungi, which include yeast and molds, viruses par and parasites. And harmful effects include spoilage of food, foodborne toxins, foodborne infections, and viralborne infections. Now, before I go any further, one thing I did want to know is a lot of this chapter is review from FAB 101, um, which is um, food sanitation class and microbiology, which I believe is biology 251. So you're gonna see a lot of overlap, which is great. Repetition is good because it's all prepping you to become dietitians if you want, because a lot of these um, questions are fair game on your dietetic exam. But either way, these are just really great things to know. And this comes in handy for anybody. To, you can share with your friends, your family, your colleagues. I think it's really important that we talk about it. Um, who doesn't want to prevent illness? I'm saying if anybody has gotten food poisoning, I have. It is not fun. So definitely taking all these necessary precautions I think is great. Another note I wanted to make, I highly recommend if you haven't already to go ahead and read the chapter for your quiz, at least skim read. This presentation I feel does a really great job about incorporating concepts and enhancing material that comes directly from your book. However, I will say there are some pieces that are missing or maybe I didn't highlight as much because I wanted to give you what I thought was the most practical and the most useful um, personally and professionally. So there are some um, areas where you'll need to review specifically um, the biotechnology section which is towards the end of the chapter. Um, the, in this section it, it mostly discusses the benefits of GMOs which is great to read about but also if you want to be the most prepped for your quiz um, I would recommend reading the chapter as well as um, watching this lecture. 
Alrighty, and I talk a lot. <laughs> so um, this lecture is scheduled for at, to take up at least one hour. Um, so being that you can watch this in the comfort of your home, I sincerely recommend taking breaks or grabbing all your liquids and all your snacks so that way you know you can sit through the whole thing and take notes. I'm gonna be providing slides um, to Michelle so you can also print out the slides and follow along if you prefer to do that. Without further ado, let's continue. Okay, so we're going to start with bacteria. Um, I just went through the list of different microorganisms, and we're starting with bacteria. This, um, this is the greatest threat to food safety. They're single-celled living organisms. They can grow quickly, and uh, yes, some bacteria are useful. In this chapter, we're mainly talking about those bacteria that cause illness. So, um, The bacteria that are infectious or disease-causing, sometimes it's uh, the bacteria themselves, and other times it's the toxins that they release. So this is a list of the most common bacterial causes of foodborne illness. Um, some of you might be familiar with what's here on this list, especially because they should have come up in FAB 101 in microbiology. If you want a refresher in your book, if you go to table 26.2, you'll see um, this list and an explanation uh, what foods they typically come from. And um, let me go ahead and look at that again. Let me see. I am just like you. I do my homework and I read through the chapter as well. So yes, um, when your book in Table 26-2 talks about the source of illness, so where typically this bacteria is found, like in what foods, and then it tells you about the symptoms. And the most deadly is salmonella. I included this table. It is not in your book. This is a separate table. Um, I really liked it be in case you're any any of you are like me. I like microorganisms. I'm like, ooh, so fascinating, but don't touch me. Um, that's part of the reason why I was interested in um, microbiology so much and being at the health district and going along with the food inspector and going along. Um, uh, actually, um, my excuse me, one of my first uh, jobs as a dietitian was working at AFAN, um, which is working with patients who have HIV. And as you know, HIV is a virus, and that also is very important in um, microbiology. So yeah, um, whatever floats your boat, whatever really interests you, there's definitely a career out there for you, whether it's in dietetics or another area of um, health, food, nutrition. So definitely don't feel like um, any of your education is going to waste. There's always there's always benefits that come from it. And I only say that because I know it can sometimes be a stressful time, um, especially when you're in the Nutrition 300 level because now you're thinking about getting pretty serious and making that decision whether you want to become a dietitian or utilize your degree in another capacity. So I always, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I always go off on a tangent and talk about that a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of areas of nutrition and health and food that um, wherever your interests lie, you can definitely find a job in that area. So back to the graph, um, I mean this table, I included it because I like that it shared the incubation period, you know, some people will have symptoms right away and some won't, how long that bacteria will stay in the body, um, the symptoms, uh, foods that typically, um, where the bacteria typically are, and then steps for prevention, which I think is the best. If we're going to talk about a problem, let's also talk about a solution. Um, so feel free to take a gander at that. Okay, next we're going to talk about fungi. So many of you think might think of mushrooms, but they also are found teeny tiny as well. Um, what also falls into the fungi category are molds and yeast. Um, some produce toxins, some are beneficial, and um, harmful mushrooms are hard to recognize. So we always recommend that you go through reputable um, supplier. Um, and then these can also cause food spoilage. Next, we talk about viruses. So viruses and bacteria are the most common microbes causing foodborne illness. Other sources of contamination include parasites, fungi, and prions. Um, viruses are extremely tiny non-cellular, non-bacteria with cellular, viruses are non-cellular agents that can survive only by infecting living or, uh, cells. This means they need a host. Um, whereas bacteria, they don't, so and they can reproduce independently either by um, either dividing or uh, forming um, spores. So there are about 31 microorganisms known to cause foodborne illness, so that's quite a bit, and th those are only what's known. 
So continuing on with viruses, um, they're not able to produce by, reproduce by themselves. Uh, they force a cell to make more viruses. Like I had said in the previous slide, they need a host. Um, some are extremely resistant to heat and cold. Um, I don't know how many of you have partners that we'll talk about there. Food safety habits. I know I talk about it with my spouse and he's constantly like the freezer will kill them or really hot water will kill them. That is not the case for every single microorganism. And I always remind him of that. So yes, um, some of these um, bacteria, virus, fungi are resistant to heat and cold. So it's good to use multiple methods of uh, food safety. So um, food typically serves as the main transportation device. So um, do not need hazardous food to survive and do not multiply in food. This is uh, viruses we're talking about. So neurovirus is one um, that I highlighted in this lecture um, because it affects so many people, 19 to 21 million infections per year. It's often referred to as a stomach flu. Of the viruses, neurovirus causes more foodborne illness than the other 30 known pathogens put together. Whoa. So, pretty intense stuff. Next, I talk about parasites. Um, they are responsible for about 2% of foodborne illnesses. Um, they need, in order to live, they need to be on or inside a host and to survive. Um, the there's two of the most common there as well as common examples are tapeworms you'll also see the word helminths this is another word for tapeworm and protozoa um, preventing parasites from causing foodborne illness um, going through approved and reputable suppliers com um, this is commonly associated with seafood so you want to make sure that you're getting your seafood from an approved and reputable supplier and uh, making sure that the seafood is fresh and it's associated with contaminated water. Um, here, I included just a couple other that we didn't really talk about. Protozoa was on the last slide, but I didn't talk about it too much. Um, and it's mostly, it's most commonly the cause of waterborne illness. Um, but again, going back to the previous slide here, we were talking about um, parasites that are uh, commonly associated with seafood, um, contaminated water. So protozoa falls into that category. Your book uh, mentions Guardia, um, and it causes di di a diarrhea illness. <laughs> um, and then hepatitis A is another one. I don't know if you guys knew this, but last year there was a hepatitis A outbreak, and that was um, fecal oral contamination. So that means people were using the restroom and then not washing their hands. So um, that's a really easy step and a way to prevent foodborne illness, so I can't emphasize hand washing enough. I'm going to be bringing it up again in a later slide. Okay, so some microbes cause illness by secreting toxins. So one of them is Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism, um, which blocks nerve transmission to muscle cells and could even in some people cause paralysis. Nasty little bugger. Um, toxins can be neurotoxins, which means damage the nervous system, or enterotoxins, which damage the GI tract. Fungi can produce my mycoto mycotoxins. Um, toxic algae can contaminate fish and shellfish, and a variety of plant toxins can also cause um, illness. There are some individuals in the population that are more at risk than others. Those include uh, pregnant women, infants, children, elderly, and those who are immunocompromised. For example, those with cancer and or HIV AIDS. Uh, additionally, though, anybody who's fighting off a cold or flu, their um, white blood cells are being used to fight off um, that sickness. So they are also susceptible to foodborne illness. Um, so pregnant women are advised to avoid eating deli meats unless they are steaming hot. I love that the textbook I got this from uses that. Um, to reduce their risk from severe illness, um, such as from listeria. Um, also, uh, it's talking about deli meats. Um, so it says unless they are steaming hot. I wouldn't even go with that. I mean, I would just have the, I would just, if you had a client that was, um, pregnant and she was concerned about um, contracting foodborne illness, I would just really highly encourage her or her family members or, or her roommates, whoever is living with her, um, to make sure that they're cooking um, their food to the right internal temperature. We talk about that later, um, but just making sure she's cooking. If we, if we, you know, like I was telling you earlier, we don't have a lot of control in the farm to table um, schema, but we do 
have a lot of control in the table arena. So what I mean is if someone is um, pregnant and they're concerned about contracting foodborne illness, one of my recommendations would be to eat at home more often and practice food safety from home than to go out often and eat. Because if it's at home, then you're in more control of if your food will be contaminated or not. Yeah, I think it's funny that that textbook says that. Steaming hot. I'm like, uh. Anyways, okay, so one thing you guys may have heard of is it's a great acronym, Fat Tom. So it says it stands for food, acidity, temperature, time, oxygen, and moisture. So all of these... Um, all of these are factors that influence the growth of microorganisms. Your book does a good job of breaking each one down, um, so be sure to check that out. I don't know, some of you might have um, the physical book and some of you might have the electronic copy. In the physical book, it's on page 422. So if you wanna read further into ways that um, you can control these uh, factors, then that's there on page 42. So here are four factors that affect the survival and reproduction of food microorganisms. Um, those get, that can cause human illness thrive in the temperature danger zone. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, so just keep that in mind. Many thrive in environments of high humidity. Most have a preferred acidity range, and many, though not all, depend on oxygen content to function. So these are, again, referring back to um, this acronym. So if, if we can control some of these factors, um, then we are able to control whether or not um, our, the microorganisms will um, not only get on the food, but also stop the growth of them or eliminate them entirely. So these are good things to keep in mind. For anyone who's, who is currently working in the food industry, I'm sure a lot of this stuff is also review. Um, and hopefully you're practicing in your restaurants these um, these uh, food safety habits as well. So an overview of Fat Tom, factors we can control the most, time and temperature. Um, anaerobic uh, organisms, uh, we have to be on the lookout for, right? That means that they can survive in areas that don't have oxygen. Um, wh whether the environment or not is moist, um, the storage temperature is important for like our refrigerators and our freezers. Um, lag time, that means like how long after we cook the, lag time means after how long we cook the food and then how long was it sitting out at what temperature. So we want to get it to the, um, out of the temperature danger zone as quick as possible. And um, the infectious disease note there is just, to, is just a reminder that if you're sick, stay home. And also um, the, some of the some of the microorganisms can be transferred um, if you're not washing your hands. So being aware and always making sure that you are doing that and you're not rubbing your nose and then touching food, like making sure that you're staying clean when you're working with food or even better, wearing gloves um, if you're concerned about that. Okay, so here's a temperature danger zone. So you can see here the danger zone is pretty wide. So um, here you'll see from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So what that means is we need to keep foods lower that, than 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If we're chilling our food, we want it to be um, lower than 40 degrees. And then if we're cooking food, um, we want it to be higher than 140 degrees. Um, here, it, <clears throat> this I really like, I put the two together because I really like this is a great reference for anyone who's cooking at home and checking the temperatures of their foods. Um, but and even if anybody's working at a restaurant and you want to make that part of your HACCP plan, if it's not already, um, then that's a really good idea to do as well. So here it shows your refrigerator temperature, 40 degrees or lower, and then freezing temperature, zero degrees Fahrenheit or lower, which actually 32 degrees is freezing. So I'm like, hmm, maybe that was a little bit of a mistake there. <laughs> um, I like that it says allow rest for at least three minutes. That's great. Okay, and then holding temperature for cooked food is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Those of you who have ever worked in catering know about that temperature. Um, and then as you go up, this is showing the minim minimum internal temperature. So when you're using your thermometer and you're checking whether your food is fully done, this is a great way to know. So ham, fully cooked and reheated. Um, beef, pork, lamb, uh, roast, steaks, chops should be at 145 internal um, degrees Fahrenheit. 
Egg dishes and ground meat should be at 160 degrees. And then poultry stuffing casseroles, um, you want them, or reheating leftovers, you want them to be an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Poultry, meaning chicken, duck. Um, so yeah, I like this. Uh, I feel like this slide does a really good job covering that. So some ways of preventing foodborne illness. This is all about that table area of the schema. Um, when preparing foods at home, be sure to wash hands and wipe down the kitchen surfaces often. Separate food to prevent cross-contamination. Most common is cutting different kinds of raw food with the same knife. So um, you should have learned in FAB 101 and FAB 159, um, cut your vegetables first to wash your wash your fruits and vegetables cut those first and then if you're going to be dealing with raw meat then you can utilize your cutting board or you can use two different cutting boards one for produce and one for raw meat um, you want to chill or freeze foods to prevent microbes from growing and then cook foods to their proper temperature this slide is all about washing your hands i told you i would come back to it i can't help myself <laughs> so um is these are just really simple um, little reminders, which I'm sure you guys hear often. But one little thing that I included that I really like, I'm sorry, I'm biased, I love the Southern Nevada Health District, um, is there's this little graphic, I've seen it actually hung up in some restaurants that I go to, and it's just these little like soap bubbles or these little soap suds, and they're talking about how to wash and when to wash. So it's been kind of cool. I see those. Maybe you'll catch those next time you're in a restaurant. But um, I think it's great that they're passing the message along. Here's a really simple infographic on reducing foodborne illness. I know that my slides can be wordy. I can talk a lot. So I like this because it's just simple. Clean, separate, cook, chill. This is... Um, talking about um, food and your workstation really simple clean separate cook chill I just included this in case you were curious um, how long you can keep foods refrigerated for um, this is just like best practices so feel free to take a screenshot or maybe you'll keep this slide if you printed it um, but I really like that it's a good rule of thumb So typically, this is the halfway point. Typically, I would ask you all if you needed me to slow down or if you had any questions, and I'm sorry that we can't do that in this setting, um, but I did provide my email address, and Michelle is, uh, is a great resource as well, so feel free if there's something I didn't cover or you felt um, there was, you had a question about something, please feel free to ask. This is, you know, your education, and I think that it's really important that you let us know if you need help with a concept or if you had a question or you want to push back on something, um, maybe something that you learned elsewhere or read, you know, that's always really good um, for us to just be um, fact checking and um, be, I, I like to be part of the learning process together. I really think that students and instructors can learn a lot from each other. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me or Michelle. Okay, so we're getting back to cross-contamination. Um, so transporting harmful substances, um, I like that it says harmful. Well, like, I guess we're transporting things that may have uh, microorganisms knowingly or unknowingly, so hands that touch raw foods. I, whenever I cut raw meat, I always make sure that I'm just touching the raw meat with my left hand and, and keeping the knife in my right hand. So like if I'm cutting chicken and I want to dice the chicken before I throw it in the pan, I'm really good about that. And then afterwards, I make sure to clean the entire, like I clean everything right after. Um, so that way I'm not worried about like salmonella or like getting raw meat or raw chicken on something else. So yeah, cutting boards or cleaning cloths. Oh, that's another one. Oh, uh, yeah. If you're using cleaning cloth on raw meat, I'm like, oh, go ahead and throw that in the laundry right when you're done or rinse it off or whatever you do. But, like, yeah, be aware of it not cross contaminating, touching raw food or somewhere, uh, another part of your um, table that you're going to be eating off of. Um, being aware that raw, I like how the word choice of the textbook is so great. Raw or contaminated food drips fluids. Okay, so say we're dealing with raw chicken or we're dealing with raw beef. I mean, you're going to see um, those fluids dripping. So just being aware and keeping your station clean. Um, improper storage in the refrigerator. So <clears throat> if you're um, 
if your refrigerator is not that cold and you just got done cooking and you take that really hot food and you put it into the fridge that's not so cold, it's not going to get below that 40 degree Fahrenheit um, temperature danger zone quick enough. So one sometimes what I do is I let the food um, rest for a bit, let it cool down on its own for a bit, and then um, I store it and then I put it towards the back of the fridge for it to get colder faster. Um, so that's just one thing that I do. Um, maybe the way that you're the ways that you're already doing work great for you. More tips for preventing foodborne illness. Food should be cooked thoroughly to kill microbes. Leftovers should be stored in the refrigerator for a limited period of time. Food should be thawed slowly in the refrigerator or microwave. Okay, so like with thawing food, I typically run water over the frozen package. So I know some people would be like, oh my gosh, that's such a waste of water. But I really like that. And um, the refrigerator is great if you remember to take it out the day before. But if it's the same day, micro microwave is a good idea too. But I always just run the water because then I can, I know exactly when it's thawed and I can, um, I can go ahead and start cooking right when I want to. Um, but if you guys have any tips too, I would highly recommend sharing them. Whether you guys have a classroom discussion board or you want to send an email out to your um, classmates on an article that you read or if you guys have any tips for preventing foodborne illness, I think it'd be great to share. Um, so don't feel like you're limited to just what I'm lecturing on or what the textbook presents. Um, do feel free to include some of your life experiences as well. And when shopping, purchase refrigerated and frozen foods. Um, they last longer. So here's a food contamination scenario. I like it because it kind of just puts into perspective everything we've been talking about. Um, so cooked, f this is for example, cooked food is contaminated with bacteria Staphylococcus aureus when served by a person with unwashed hands, dun dun dun. Then food is left unrefrigerated. The bacteria multiply in unrefrigerated food and p produce a toxin. Later, leftover food is reheated. Reheating destroys bacteria, but not the toxin. Reheating the food is eat. The reheated food is eaten, and after one to six hours, nausea, vomiting, and stomach pain are induced. They occur. So there you have it. There's a classic example of how food contamination can occur. Um, forgive me for my dra dramatic voice, but sometimes it comes out when I'm uh, <laughs> lecturing. More tips for preventing foodborne illnesses. I love that this textbook, okay, so I use not only um, information from our um, food science um, textbook, I also pull information from another nutrition textbook that I have. Um, so I love that one of the tips that was given is eat at restaurants that look clean. I'm like, yes, but we only see front of the house. We don't see back of the house, so, but hopefully front of the house matches back of the house. Or maybe if you do see some of the area where the kitchen is, you know, be, be looking around, make sure I guess it looks quote unquote clean, but also check their grade. Boom. I'm going to do another plug in right here. Um, highly recommend downloading this free app. Um, the restaurant grades of Southern Nevada. Uh, it's a great app. I use it all the time. Um, no, I'm not, this is not a paid advertisement or anything like that. I just really like that app and I'm just one that I've had food poisoning and I don't want to experience that again. So I'm always checking. And whenever my friends recommend a restaurant, I instantly, if they do not have a grade that's an A, I shut that idea down. I'm like, nope, next, try something else because I'm not going there. Okay, um, insist that food be cooked thoroughly. That's my husband's big thing. He always makes sure that he always has his eggs scrambled and he always makes sure his meat is well done. So if you're that person, then cool. You can ask them to cook your food thoroughly. When traveling, avoid, avoid raw food, salads, unpasteurized milk, and uncooked fruits and vegetables. Um, select beverages carefully. Um, this is really interesting. I had a student that told me that they had gone to, I believe, Mexico and... Um, they were really good about not drinking tap water, but I guess um, they had ordered um, drinks at a restaurant and they came with ice and I guess that water that was used for the ice was contaminated. She got foodborne illness from that. Either, she said it was either that or the salad she ate. I just felt really bad. Anybody getting foodborne illness is just awful. Um, so yeah, when traveling, avoid uh, uncooked fruits and vegetables, select beverages carefully, and then use a waterless antibacterial hand cleanser, hand sanitizer uh, frequently.
All right, so here are some tips that the textbook gives for preventing food spoilage. They include salting or sugaring, drying, smoking, and cooling. Um, so those are some options. Uh, these are some options for preserving food. I typically go with cooling or I've never tried drying, smoking, salting, or sugaring myself, but anybody who's made like jellies or preservatives uh, or preserves, I should say preserves, um, then they know about the sugaring. Um, but I haven't tried salt myself salting drying or smoking um, but i have purchased uh, pro food products that have gone through that process other modern techniques of preventing spoilage include canning pasteurization irradiation hopefully you've already gone over that in another um in another chapter but if not let me know and aseptic packaging let me know i have a cool video that i showed um in my food science class the year before. I can send that your guys' way. Um, aseptic packaging, modified atmospheric packaging, and high pressure processing. So government regulators, um, here mo mostly we're talking about a HACCP plan. So um, that's what we're gonna be talking about for the next few slides. So what does HACCP stand for? Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. Um, if you're not familiar with a HACCP plan, I'm sure you'll become familiar through this lecture and or later on. I took, um, I think it was nutrition or food business and it's, it's a class your senior year. They should still be offering that and you also have to like create your own little HACCP plan. Um, so this system in, in, I, is designed to identify biological, chemical, and other potential food safety hazards during distribution and sales. And how do you avoid those? So your HACCP plan talks about that too. There, it's a multi-step protocol that is um, it put in place to prevent um, areas where food um, food safety can be utilized to prevent foodborne illness. So it analyzes hazards, identifies critical control points. Critical control points are those areas where we can intervene. Establish preventative measures, establish procedures, establish corrective actions, verify system is working, and then effective record keeping. So this is really important to have a HACCP plan because, um, and be utilizing it because say something happens where a patron or a customer at your restaurant does um, contract a foodborne illness, you can go back to this plan and look through the steps and see what might have been missed. You can see like, if if we if you weren't holding the food at the proper temperature if you weren't cooling it down to the proper temperature in the right amount of time i don't know if you guys have ever heard of blast chillers but um they're these they're these um i don't know how to call them like i guess like really powerful refrigerators that they can cool you put a thermometer on the inside of the food that you're putting in the blast chiller and it is meant to cool your food down faster and get it down to the degree that you want. Um, so then you can move it from the blast chiller to a refrigerator. Um, but you don't want the food hanging out in the uh, temperature danger zone. So that's why a blast chiller was created. So anyways, that could be part of your HACCP plan. You know, if you're making a certain food and you want it to be cooled within a certain amount of time, then you can put it in the blast chiller um, and maybe somebody in your restaurant is new and they didn't know that and so food was um, left in the temperature danger zone for a long period of time and that's how the microorganisms started so that's an example um, there's a lot of different areas of the HACCP plan um, but that's just one example So I like to include this little infographic. Um, this is kind of just like fun. This is an example of what a HACCP plan would entail. Um, so know your food and your food products and know what makes them safe to consume. Look at how you produce food products from start to finish by understanding the practical process and the production environment. <clears throat> Identify potential hazards and decide where they could occur in the preparation pro process. Put in place preventative measures, i.e. controls with defined safety limits. Monitor the control, check the safety limits have been achieved. So I like that it has a thermometer. That's often part of the HACCP plan is checking the internal temperatures of foods. Write it down a lot of places. I mean, the restaurants, all the restaurants I've ever worked at, um, <clears throat> I've had to um, write down at, at some point or another 
like when the food was chilled, when I put it in the blast chiller, when I took it out, the temperature at which I put it in the blast chiller it was at, and when I took it out, the temperature it was at. So write it all down and keep records. That um, So you have evidence as well. If you have a food inspector coming and they're looking at your... Um, and they're looking at your logs, they can tell, they can say like, oh my gosh, you haven't been keeping track for the last month, you know, and you can get in trouble and up for that. So yeah, restaurants should have this in place. And then review and confirm the HACCP system is working, check to see if everything is working as intended, if not change it. This is usually a manager's job. Um, so they're, they're supposed to be checking it, but somebody's supposed to be checking it. So making sure that you know who's in charge of that as well. Um, because that's something that a food inspector would want to know make sure that you are um, you're following those procedures and you have those in place and that everyone's on the same page because they can ask you any question that they want to ask you all right next Okay, so just a little bit of an overview on the HACCP um, plan and food safety. There's new challenges that are constantly um, occurring. I'm in the very beginning of the slide, we were talking about all the things that make it difficult to ensure food safety. Um, such a di there's such a diversity of products and processes. Um, advantages of a HACCP plan focuses on identifying and preventing hazards focus uh, based on sound science, eff effective government oversight. We talk about that a little bit later in this um, slideshow. Responsibility on the manufacturer distributor, yes, and the company and the restaurant, like I said, when I was there with the food inspector and we got to shut a restaurant down, it's the responsibility of that restaurant to be making sure that they are maintaining um, these protocols, these rules, regulations, policies, I mean, they're there for a reason, um, and I'm really grateful that it's enforced. Again, I keep on saying it, food foreign illness is no fun to deal with. So, And it helps companies compete uh, more effectively. So then your um, the next this ending part of the um, presentation is talking about other things that we have. We've mostly focused on microorganisms, so now we're talking about um, a few other things um, considerations, I suppose, that maybe we hadn't thought of um, that could also lead to um, food poisoning and foodborne illness. We talk a little bit about processing and handling, cleaning and sanitation, and we end with um, government um, regulators. So birds and rodents carry many diseases and parasites, so you want to make sure that your restaurant, your kitchen, your area is clear of those. Um, true story, when I went with the food inspectors, I got to go so I did ride along for two days with two separate food inspectors. And when I was at their office, they, um, excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> so each of them had a, each of them had pictures on their wall from sites that they had visited. And I saw some really gruesome, like nasty stuff. I mean, I saw, rodents dead rodents in kitchens I saw cockroaches and different oh and different um bugs that were they these inspectors had taken pictures while they were on the job these are things that they saw so it's just gross so anyways uh you would think that it's common sense you would think that we would say hey this is pretty obvious don't allow rodents birds and insects into your kitchen or in your areas but if nobody um, is paying attention or cares about the cleanliness of the restaurant, apparently this does happen. Um, insects seek heat, moisture, and darkness. So there's definitely crevices where um, insects would want to get into a kitchen that was not uh, well maintained. Most, or I should say, not just a kitchen facility, right? Because this is a this is applied across the board to any food processing, food manufacturing areas. So. Most cost-effective method is to have reputable pest control company coming out and making sure they're spraying the outside of the building as well and then um, following the guidelines for pest prevention. Often though, it's just keeping the area clean because birds, rodents, insects, they're also looking for food. So if you're not sweeping and mopping every single day, that's also, and, and cleaning in general, um, that's also a reason why the, those might come inside or be attracted is there's food or there's something that's on the ground that they're interested in. 
Okay, so a little bit about processing and handling. Um, keeping microbial lo loads at minimal levels. So the more often that we're cleaning and doing these things that um, are, are part of our food safety, um, the less like the we can keep the microorganism levels low, um, so where they're not ha harmful levels, but also um, by cleaning and sanitizing properly, we can destroy those microorganisms. Um, there's two pro heat processes that the book talks about, pasteurization and sterilization, um, but the one thing, um, pasteurization does not kill spores. Okay, so cleaning and sanitizing. It's the most important aspect. Um, detailed procedures must be developed, so this could be part of the HACCP plan. It could also just be part of the policies and procedures for the cleanliness of the facility. Um, cleaning frequency must be clearly defined, yes. Anybody who's been in management or worked with coworkers that are lazy know that if a manager comes and says, you know, somebody needs to sweep or mop. Unless they assign it to somebody, it is not going to get done. So cleaning frequency must be clearly defined. I know that in places that I've worked at, there's usually like um, a log where the last person who what, did whatever task um, puts their initials in the time. So I think that that's really effective, especially for accountability. So you're making sure that all the employees are being rotated or that if there is a sole employee designated to that job that they're doing it. Um, must be evaluated for adequacy. Yes, managers should be checking that. And then correct order of events. Correct any issues where um, we could do better or where there are errors that are occurring. We should be, sh be sure to take corrective measures. Okay. So cleaning, why, why do we clean? Because we're trying to get rid, rid of quote unquote food soil. Um, any, anything that's left behind um, that food that bacteria can grow on um, or parasites can live in. So let's make sure that we're cleaning up as best as we can. Um, categorize, there are categorized cleaning methods that the book lays out, mechanical cleaning, um, clean out of place and manual cleaning. Um, Microbiome microbiological biofilms contribute to soil buildup on surfaces so we definitely want to make sure that we're using a variety of cleaning and sanitation methods um, because soils very <clears throat> widely soil food soil you know what's in that particular soil could be anything right like if you were cook cutting vegetables you're cooking raw meat if you're not cleaning everything down then parts of traces from that food are left behind so that's what the book means when it's talking about soils um, because soils vary widely in composition no single detergent is capable of removing all types many complex films contain combinations of food components surface oil or dust insoluble cleaner components um, and insoluble hard water salts which i know some of us have encountered living here in las vegas unless you have a water softener which i don't so i'm very aware of um, those hard water salts that get left behind and then crystallize and then you know that's an area for bacteria and things to grow on too so um I love that the book talks about this uh, because like I had said I don't know if you ever talk to your partners if like some of you are more cleanly than the others but like sometimes people in my household they just want to use soap and water on surfaces but as you know especially with this whole coronavirus thing going on you know that's not the only form of um, cleaning and sanitation right because depending on the soap you're using it can maybe maybe kill some bacteria but not all certainly I mean some dish soaps have um, antimicrobial or antibacterial agents in them but not all of them do um, so you could use that on surfaces and they, you know, some are good degreasers, so you could use that on the stove, but even if you did use them, either you should follow up or alternatively use, um, cleaning solutions that are going to be able to target, um, those microorganisms, you know, whether those are Lysol wipes or whether they're like bleach or another chemical. Um, so here, if you're working in like a facility, soils may be classified as these different things and then based on that I don't know if you guys have worked in the industry or not but when I was working there we had different um san we had different how would you call this I guess cleaning or sanitation liquids and they were d divvied up based on what you were going to clean and like based on what surfaces you were going to clean and which ones are most effective so we had like three different kinds so if you read the label um a lot of those that are um made for industry are labeled as soluble in water which will take care of sugars some starches and most salts 
soluble in acid, so this is talking about limestone and other mineral deposits, and then soluble in water, alkali, or acid. So this is how they'd be um, categorized and separated. So you would use that cleaning or sanitation um, liquid ba on the surface based on what you're trying to target. So we're talking about sanitation. There are appropriate and approved sanitation procedures to, oh, I said two, but there's multiple. There's other, sorry. <laughs> the general types of sanitation here, uh, thermal include heat, a water or steam, and then there's chemical, and, and then you wanna talk, you wanna think about the concentration and contact time. So I know earlier I mentioned bleach, and um, for any of you who've worked with that, this is, you can apply it to, this is just an example, but other chemicals too. You wanna be careful, and you wanna make sure you're using the right concentration of that chemical with water. A lot of times you're using a small amount of that chemical and then diluting it with water, but it, you still have the chemical. So just being careful of the concentration levels and then contact time, how often that you're cleaning and when the last time was that you cleaned. Um, so hot water sanitizing, um, your book talks about immersion um, sprays, such as what's found in dishwashers and circulating systems. And there's, there are state regulations on dish on water temperature and pH for dishwashers. Um, so I'm your book mentions that, but I also wanted to mention that I got to witness that when I went um, on that those ride alongs. Uh, when I was there with the food inspectors, they had their thermometer and they were checking everything. They were checking the temperature of food that was cooking, the temperature of food in the refrigerators, the um, temperature of the dish the the dish water. How do you say this? The dishwasher water. So they were checking um, not only the the temperature, but they were checking the pH and they were checking um, to see what chemicals or soaps were being used in the dishwasher too, to clean the dishes and to clean the dishwasher themselves. Because the dishwashers, if you guys are, you know, like I'm talking about not like people who are um, who are employed to be a dishwasher. I'm talking about machines that are dishwashers themselves. So those are supposed to, their water is supposed to be at a proper um, temperature and um, the solutions that are being used to clean the dishes, that's one thing, but then the dishwasher is itself supposed to be sanitized every night. So it's different for everyone, but that's pretty standard. Okay, so we're coming up on the end. Thank you for hanging and I'm doing pretty good on time coming up on my hour, so... I was planning on lecturing for an hour originally, and then the last 15 minutes would have been for Q&A, or I left buffer time for questions in between, so um, it is a little bit on the shorter side, but um, I hope that you appreciate it. <laughs> so regulatory consideration, um, I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of slides the CDC, the FDA, and the USDA, and the EPA. So there's multiple government agencies involved in ensuring the safety and quality of food supplies. So if you're someone that's like, oh, I'm really into this. Um, I know I mentioned food inspector. That's definitely, there's a lot of positions at the health district that fall into this category, what we've been talking about today. But also government agent, other government agencies such as the CDC, USDA, and EPA, and FDA are all options too if you wanted to work with them and promote food safety. But they do have different roles. So the CDC, Centers for disease control and prevention, promote and educate the public about health and safety, and they track foodborne illness outbreaks. And if you were to work at the SNHD, we report all of our numbers to the CDC. Pretty cool stuff. The USDA oversees meat, poultry, and eggs. The EPA regulates use of pesticides and establishes water quality standards. And uh, we have, there's an environmental, um, sector uh, within the health district as well. I believe the food inspectors actually fall into that one. Yeah. Um, and then Food and Drug Administration regulates food standards for all food products except meat, poultry, and eggs, right, because that's covered by the USDA, and bottled water, and then it regulates food labeling and enforces pesticide use regulations. So it's pretty interesting how all four make up the different, ro the different roles that they have and how all four help to ensure um, the highest food quality and water quality and health quality overall, right? Um, so I'm very grateful for, I know that sometimes, you know, there's always room for improvement for any agencies or individuals, but um, I do think that they do, they play a big role in making sure that our food is safe. And um, if you think they could be doing better and 
um, and you're interested in this, then you can totally apply and work for them. This final table I, I just wanted to include because it instead of looking at all or all two of the uh, separate slides, you could look at just this one. Uh, or if not, cool. Uh, I try to give you guys as much information as I think is useful for understanding food safety. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, thank you for coming along on this journey with me. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time.